This week, our special guest is Tyler Shields from Signal Sciences Corporation. We're going to do some listener feedback from Matt and Ben right in and ask us some questions. We'll talk about that. And why a six-hour workday makes us happier and more productive. How startups can use open source software to compete against the big guys and so much more. Stay tuned for this edition of Startup Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. NetMon Freemium delivers real-time network visibility to quickly identify emerging threats in your IT environment. NetMon Freemium is a free, commercial-grade network forensics and traffic analytics solution. You can use NetMon Freemium's powerful capabilities to search against all observed network traffic, identify abnormal traffic patterns and application usage, and quickly analyze full packet captures. Take the first step towards real-time network visibility. Visit logarithm.com forward slash freemium to learn more and download it today. Welcome everyone to Startup Security Weekly, episode 17 for November 18th, 2016. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, founder and CEO of the Security Weekly Network of Podcasts. In addition to offensive countermeasures, with me on the lines via Skype is the beach bum himself <laughs> and security <laughs> catalyst developing IT security leaders for today, Mr. Michael Santarcangelo. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks, Paul. It's uh, I missed you last week, brother. I do okay without you. I was, you know, I was thinking about. I'm like, I didn't do this show last week, and then I was like, oh yeah, I was watching it live, commenting on on Facebook. I, know. I saw your comment. Yeah. I, like, well. I think I, I think I had a, a kid or two on me while I was watching it, and he's like, Daddy, what's that? I'm like, well, that's one of Daddy's podcasts. He's like, why aren't you on it, Daddy? I'm like, because it goes better without Daddy. He's like, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> hey, I don't know, man. You doing it that way? We ended up uh, setting up an event at Infosec World. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Gather and drink with people. So it's awesome. I thought it went well. It was good. No, good, I good. miss you though. I, I like our banter. I like our conversations. <laughs> Absolutely. So this will be um, good. I want to encourage everyone to take our uh, listener feedback survey, securityweekly.com forward slash survey. Let us know how we're doing, how we can improve, and uh, make suggestions for content that you want to see on this show and all of the other shows within our network. So it makes your listening experience more enjoyable to fill out the survey. It's a short survey, about 13 questions. So go fill it out, securityweekly.com forward slash survey. All righty. Uh, I think that's it for announcements. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our very special guest for today, Tyler Shields, who is the Vice President of Marketing, Partnerships, and Strategy at Signal Sciences Corporation. Um, <clears throat> prior to getting into the, the startup kind of thing, uh, you may recognize Tyler from uh, his work at Veracode, Symantec, Lurk, SecureWorks, and At Stake. Tyler, you've been around the industry for a long time, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Yeah, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. It's, um, yeah, I, I'm way too old, I'm older than I'd like to admit, that's for sure. <clears throat> Whenever I, I actually uh, when I was giving a presentation yesterday and I was talking about signal sciences and I'm like, Tyler, and then I blanked on your last name for a minute and I'm like, Shields? And I looked at Rob Shane. That we hadn't even talked before the presentation, but I knew you had a similar background. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's right, Tyler Shields. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, that's right. You guys both go go way back, which is pretty funny. Yeah, we, we go back to the uh, to the old school era. Uh, uh, yeah, so we're, we're kind of the old people now, the old crotchety uh, <laughs> security people. <laughs> nice. And the old crotchety security people are doing security startups, which is, uh, which is pretty fun. 
Um, yeah, no, I, I think that's fantastic. I think it's 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 all about trying to do something you're passionate about, and right, we've been passionate about security forever. So why not take it to to the next level? And I wanted to ask you first, Tyler. You know, uh, kind of given your background uh, the, in technology, you're very much a technical person, uh, having been at, at stake and, and in that kind of circle of people. Uh, now you're t- you're carrying a title of vice president of marketing. Like, what was that like to go through that transition? Yeah, it's funny. I was working with Chris Ang at the time over at Veracode when I actually left to become an analyst at Forrester, and he bought me a a Darth Vader mask. I actually, this is a video podcast. I should have brought it. I still got it. He bought me a Darth Vader mask and and told me I have to wear that whenever I'm on analyst calls. Um, I still have it to this day. But, you know, for me, I I kind of, uh, the technology passion wasn't there anymore. The security passion was there, but I started finding a passion for wanting to build businesses and and helping people and businesses grow. And so that's where I decided to focus my time. And as long as you're working on something you're passionate about, you'll uh, you, you know you'll never be you'll never really work a day in your life. <clears throat> Absolutely, I agree. Um, so let's talk about how you did. Uh, what was it like? In, you did a, a startup before Signal Sciences, is that correct? Yeah, so I've done a number of my. Actually, my first startup was in the late '90s out in Silicon Valley. Uh, it was actually a billing company. Uh, software billing company in the late 90s that uh, it, it rode the whole IPO roller coaster, uh, you know, front 1,500 employees and then proceeded to fall to nothing after the bust. Uh, then I was in At Stake when it was still a privately held startup. Uh, Luric was a was a startup that got bought by SecureWorks. Veracode, I was a early, semi-early uh, member of that startup as well. So I've done a number of them. What's, what's unique about running a security startup, Tyler? Oh, man. The, I would say the most unique thing there is it's the expertise level of the market that you have to have, the technical side of the market that you have to have. Um, you see so many people try to set up security startups without having that right tech person that has that right background and that right level of understanding uh, on, on how the, the technology works, and you just aren't going to get anywhere. You can have all the business experience in the world without the tech background. You're, you're never going to be successful. And I'd say that's the hardest thing. The second hardest thing is... Uh, selling security technology. Yeah. You're trying to sell a technology that people in general don't want. It's something they have to have, and that's just a hard sale. It's interesting, Tyler, and I, you may have said this to me in, in conversations we've had outside the show, uh, and I, I believe it was underscored by Brian Baer, uh, and he said, you know, as when you f- start a security startup, really the founders have to be involved with the very early sales and have to be very engaged with those customers. And I think you underscored that in some of our conversations as well. And I really took that to heart and we're really focusing on applying that to our startup today. Is that advice that you, you have for people? And if you could expand upon that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the early part of any any startup, any startup, whether it's security or not, is relationship selling from the founders of the company, and it's about iterating to uh, to getting to product market fit. Right, that's the number one thing that you have to do with any startup, and the easiest way to iterate to product market fit is to iterate with a customer that you know is going to want your technology. And the easiest way to find those early customers is relationships. I mean, uh, so Signal Sciences, which is the startup I'm currently with, was founded by. Uh, Three gentlemen from Etsy, one of which uh, Zane Lackey is a pretty well-known security researcher. And, you know, between the three relationships, those three guys and all the relationships that they have in the security space and, and knowing CISOs around the world, that was all of our early sales, right? I mean, that was that is just how you start a business. And it mm-hmm. do, doesn't even matter the market, but it's doubly so in security because it's a hard thing to sell. <clears throat> I completely agree. Michael, did you have questions for Tyler? I didn't want to hog all the airtime. Here. No, I, I'm I'm just enjoying listening to you talk. I trust me. I I'm not afraid to speak up when I got a question. <clears throat> um. So, what does your startup do, Tyler? Uh, Signal Sciences. Yeah. Um. So it's it's uh, a, a next generation web application firewall technology. Um, we're starting to actually use the term web protection platform now because we've added such amazing features. But really, we're kind of taking a we're we're targeting the web application firewall market that has just in general been a pretty uh, lack of has had a lack of innovation for the last eight to ten years and really innovated that market with. Um, new ways of collecting the data that we need to make our security decisions and then really advanced and accurate ways to make those security decisions. And so in some ways you could say we're a RASP or runtime application self-protection engine. Uh, In other ways, we're a next generation web application firewall. At the end of the day, we're providing web protection, web server protection, regardless Mm -hmm. of whether it's a um, uh, you know, regardless of your container, your cloud, your, uh, your design, your architecture, it doesn't matter. 
Well, you in, know what, actually, in that respect, so, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, in that respect, it's different from Rasp. What I always uh, understood from, from Rasp is that it had to run kind of inside your application server and be coded and tuned to run inside your application server. It sounds like your technology uh, is uh, separated by a layer from that, but can still provide the same level of protections. Yeah, so it definitely provides the same level of protections, if not better more accurate, uh, just as uh, zero, very close to zero latency impact, those kinds of things. I think the key for web application firewall market, and to kind of take it back to the startup mentality, is to, uh, you kind of have to look for, um, uh, you know, a market that's ready for doing something a new way. And that's what RASP did, right? It yeah. targeted the WASP market and said, here's a new way of doing it. But at the end of the day, you're not selling a technology. And from a startup perspective, that's super important to know. You don't sell a technology. You sell a business value, mm -hmm. right? And so the business value provided by all the RASP vendors is the same business value provided by WAF, provided by a web protection platform like ours. Um, and so we all compete in the same market, no matter what you call that market. I got you. So, but from my understanding, WAF is the, the firewall, but it doesn't have enough intelligence about the application to be as effective as something like RAFs, which does uh, provide more in-depth information about the application in the application server, getting that information from the application server. And, but then the concern, the problems are with RAFs. People say, well, you know, what about performance and what about tuning? And then I also looked at a technology called Cloud DMZ, which to me sounds like they take your web application and they host it in their cloud, and they act as a proxy and do security on your application. Uh, your technology uh, seemed like a, a kind of a combination of all three, or solving the problems that all you know three of those uh, solutions are providing. Is that is that an accurate description? I think that's totally accurate. Yeah, it's where you, it's where you decide to deploy us, right? Most of our customers deploy us as a plugin to the web server instance. So, for example, nginx as an nginx plugin. So we're right in the heart of the application. Uh, we have other customers who deploy us at the code level as a library uh, embedded at the code level, right? So we can get uh, code application and code context that way. Mm -hmm. uh, others will will put us in line as a reverse proxy. There's very few that do that, um, but there's some that want that for their model, right? And so that's why we're a web protection platform that kind of, we can do all those different methodologies. Oh, that's awesome. So when someone asks you, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve? <laughs> you read my mind. Thank like, you, like Michael, yeah. right? Because we talked about a lot of different areas and a lot of different problems. Like what's the, what's the one or two things that you, you try to hit on? Yeah, you know, it's funny. We're finding our customers uh, are really drawn to, you know, the, the concept of blocking. Uh, blocking attacks. Um, that is such table stakes, really. At the end of the day, our, what our customers are really getting excited about is visibility into uh, attacks that they've never seen before. Of course, the blocking table stakes, the ability to provide all of this data that we're collecting about the application and the security of the application, not only to their security teams, but also to their dev teams, their ops teams, their engineering teams. Um, we've actually had customers come and put our, um, uh, our our dashboard up in their dev bullpen during a proof of concept. They put, the, put our dashboard up in their dev bullpen. Uh, at the end of the proof of concept, they went to take it down, and the developers actually threw a fit because we were surfacing lists of uh, like graphical spikes of 500 errors on their web server, which you would think, okay, developers should know that already, but it turns out they don't have that visibility, right? And so we're actually, one of the fundamental tenets of our company is to break down the silos between all of these groups and democratize the information, the application security information amongst all these groups. I, lo I, lo I love that story. That's great. Uh, you can tell you've done startups before, right? When you describe the problem with a story like that, uh, it's very, it's very compelling. That developers had it, and then they didn't. They wanted to keep it. They didn't want to. They didn't want to give it up. That was that was very compelling. I like that. I'm going. I'm taking notes on that. I got to develop well, similar know, stories. What's, right? what's really compelling about that too is it, it's debunking this whole notion that the developers a aren't interested, b won't take advantage of it, c couldn't possibly. I mean. You just in a simple story said, no, I can democratize this, which I like as a word. We can break down the silos. That's, I mean, that's a big kick I'm on personally, but, you know, it's, it's, it's good. And, that, and that's like actually what I wanted to ask. I mean, I love the fact that you pointed out, you know, you're, you're not selling the features. You're selling the business outcome to it. But then so when, when we talk about the problem that you're trying to solve, there are a lot of people who listen to the show that will nod their heads and say, oh, yeah, I, I totally get WAF. Oh, yeah, I got it. They don't understand WAF at all. So what when we're looking at this, Who's buying it, and what's the problem that they're trying to solve? Like more, more categorically. So, like signal sciences, when they when they come in, how does this benefit an organization? 
Yeah, no, and that's a really good question. Of course, uh, being a startup guy and a marketing guy, I'll answer it with a bit of a story as well. That's um, perfect. <laughs> the, uh, no, the, the, um, uh, what we're finding is that we come in, uh, people come to us and say, we need protection for our web server, um, you know, for our, for our web application at the end of the day. And that's usually the, the kind of the first step that, that we get. We've actually never even had to, uh, we have plenty of customers where we've installed, gone into proof of concept and never even had to block an attack. And they've already declared, we love the value of the visibility before we even get to the, to the blocking of the attack. Right. So, uh, it's, it's not just, the blocking. That's why, you know, WAF is all about blocking and protection, but it's so much more than that. Um, you know, and so at the end of the day, it's the whole, the whole package. One interesting statistic we found is that we, we, uh, surveyed all of the users of our, um, service, not the customers, but the actual individual users that they onboard into Mm. our, um, into our portal. And we looked up all of their titles on LinkedIn or or basically got all of their titles. Uh, 53% of our user base, uh, had developer or operations titles, 47% had security related titles, which means that, the developer team is finding so much value from our technology that the security team didn't even know was there. Um, and so that's why what I think, you know, to relate this back to the success of a startup, uh, one of the things you want to look for is ways that you can get and drive lots of passion about your product and drive customers who not only love it, but want to tell the world about it, whether that world is internal to their company, like we're finding, or even external. Like we have uh, so many customers that are going out on Twitter saying, hey, you know, I just blocked XYZ attack and here's how it happened or here's the visibility I'm seeing. And so when you start to see those kinds of trends emerging in your startup, you know you're onto something big. So so you said something I thought was interesting. Uh, and I, You've got a lot of experience. I want to get your take on it. People will come to you initially and say, I want to protect my web server. And then once they get it in there, you're starting to show them, you know, there's a lot more you can do. And they, they get the value fast. But it seems to, like, by suggesting that you're next generation, you're giving them that option to say, I can solve the problem that you know that you have, and I'm going to show you some stuff you didn't know about yet. And is that how it works when you're marketing that startup? Because now that you're seeing they see the other value – they almost have to experience it before they know to ask for that, right? So if you came in and said, I'm going to give you visibility to stuff you didn't even know existed, they'd be like, yeah, but I don't have that problem. So how do you – Is do you have to bridge that? Like you have to help them solve the problem they know they have and then open their eyes to something else? Or how do you handle that? Because what you're able to give them is so much better, but that yeah. might not be what they're looking for. You know, it was a very conscious decision to market ourselves as a next generation web application firewall, uh, not because we like the term next generation. As a matter of fact, I hate the term next generation, it's, you know, <laughs> cyber, 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 right? Mm-hmm. It's just a stupid marketing term. But what we found was by taking next generation web application firewall out to market, our customers went, oh, you're a WAF. And it got us in the door instantly because now we can compete on some kind of basis of here, we know what you do. We instantly know what the business value that you bring to the table is. We have a budget for that. We're competing for budget that. We thought about going out as a RAS, a runtime application self-protection right out of the gate. Um, and we went, why would we compete for, say, a $10 million total addressable market or whatever RASP is or was at the time versus the multi-billion dollar market that is WAF? You know what? We're going to go right at WAF. We're going to make the conscious decision to take a technology out and target a market that people understand and bring them value way above and beyond what's currently offered and disrupt a market instead of build one from scratch. Now, that isn't to say that RASP won't be a successful market. I believe it will. I think it's a great technology and a great market. And we, uh, you know, we have offerings in the RASP space as well. So we play in that space as well. But what you'll see is uh, startups have to shift their marketing message over time to match the demand of the market. And uh, we recognized early on where the demand of the market was. It was in a WAF space still. And we tapped that and we grew pretty significantly. And now you'll see our marketing message continue to, to shift and expand into new areas as we expand into, you know, expand our market. That's really smart. That's really good advice for anybody listening right now. I like Tyler, that. I want to, uh, since you have a background uh, as an analyst as well, when RASP first hit the market, the analyst poo pooed it. Like big time poo pooed it. So, with, I guess in a startup sense, how do you, if a startup has a great idea, but the analysts are poo pooing it, what do you do as a startup to overcome that? Because so many enterprises, especially, uh, and even mid market, listen to the analyst firms. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was uh, on a panel literally yesterday, and the question on the panel was, uh, 
um, what do you think about hackback technologies, right? And mm-hmm. uh, there were there were three of us on the panel, three speakers on the panel, and two of the panels in, instantly, two of the panels instantly said, oh, hackback is bad idea, slippery slope, you really ought to not do it. And I went, you know, and I hadn't really thought about it before, but I went, you know what, they said the same thing about bug bounties five years ago, bad idea, slippery slope, market for bugs and for security holes is a problem. You know what, this is going to become the norm in five years, right? And so I took, I took a stance in that direction. And mostly it's because I've been wrong so many times as an analyst, <laughs> right? I've missed so many calls. It's not even funny. And any analyst that tells you they make every call is full of crap. They only, they only market the ones that they get right. And that's why analysts <laughs> end, up, end up doing well. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, the thing about analysts is, you know, we look at the data, we, we analyze it and we say, here's where I think it's going, but we're going to be wrong just as much as the next guy. And uh, he, so what's, what's funny is I, got, I actually got hooked into uh, Signal Sciences as an analyst um, because Zane, who's an old friend of mine, called me and asked me how to get analysts talking about uh, Signal Sciences and their market. And, you know, after really digging into the tech and the business, I said, well, the easiest way is to hire one full time. And I came on board. Um, but the thing is, the analysts, uh, the, the most forward thinking analysts will write about a, a future direction of a market because they're not afraid to make the mistake. And that was the analyst that I, I thought of myself, right? I wasn't afraid to make the mistake and miss the call. But I would say 80% of the analysts write about the market once it's hit that tipping point. So don't worry about trying to get the, the bulk of the analysts to push the market for you. They're not going to do it until they're confident it's going to hit. I, so my follow-up question to that, Tyler, is a lot of companies, startups and mature companies, will come up with solutions and they're for problems that people don't realize or they're for like a non-traditional solution and they have to use marketing and in other means to kind of change the way people think about things to promote their solution. Uh, and I'm sure now that I've said that you're thinking of a couple of different examples, right, where people thought, well, you know, I had this problem, but vendor comes along and said, well, if you think about it this way, you really have this different problem and we have the solution to it. I, I've seen like a 50-50 success rate, you know, success failure rate with that, uh, you know, and as a startup, how do you overcome that if you know you've got this great solution, but people are just thinking about the problem differently, and, and that could be a lot of your customers and potential, well, probably your potential customers, right, that are thinking that way. Yeah, so so from a marketing standpoint, um, I mean, this was part of that conscious decision that we didn't want to try to define a market because we didn't want to fight an uphill battle. We took a market that was already defined and innovated it. Um, first of all, number one, I would say to any startup that is, is in a similar situation, look, think out of the box. Do not think of what's going to be completely straightforward um, because building a market from scratch is a very, very difficult process. So if you can attach to an existing market uh, and then either break away later on when you're successful or attach to a market and take it over or disrupt it, it's a much easier task. If you're not even close to one, and you can't figure out how to make that work, the key, the key to building a market from scratch is content and expertise around content. So uh, content-based marketing is by far the most important thing you can do. And it's funny, I'm working with, so I sit on advisory board of two, two other startups, and I actually help at least two others beyond that uh, with kind of their marketing and messaging and how they, how they take things to market. Um, and, you know, one of the things I tell them is when you're young and you're trying to educate the market, put out content, quantity, quantity, quantity. Don't put out garbage intentionally, but it doesn't matter how good it is. Just put out content because 90% of the time you're going to be writing content that is beyond your audience. Even if you think it's simple stuff, it's going to be beyond your audience. So just put out the content. Let people consume what they want. And what you end up doing is you define yourself as a leader in that field and an expert in that field. You define your company as an expert in that field. And next thing you know, you can create a market and build it out. One of, Tyler, the, one of the challenges that I see, Tyler, along those lines is when either a startup or even a mature organization will do this as they kind of change strategies and they kind of become a startup again, right, is they'll develop content and it'll go over pretty well within their own echo chamber. And where I see a struggle is, let's, in this case, as a startup, how do I get out of my own echo chamber and, and start to grow to get my content that's changing the way people think about a, a problem and a solution, how do I get outside my own echo chamber? Yeah, it, that is a great way of thinking about it. The idea there is empathy for the customer. Okay, put yourself in the customer's shoes. And let's, let's, I'll use Signal Sciences as an example. Our customers were and are uh, engineering, operations, and security. 
So instead of writing our content only for security, which is what the background of uh, our research team and the background of uh, of myself and Zane, uh, that's our background. So we could have very easily put out 100% content just around security and hit our echo chamber 100%, uh, and that would have been okay. But uh, we had a, a resource, James Wicket, who is very well known in the DevOps world, and I tapped him early on. I said, write about DevOps. I don't, you know, it doesn't even have to be security related, right? About DevOps and security, how they connect. And so you're able to break out of your, your comfort zone by looking at most of our buyers early on were DevOps related companies, companies that were pushing the forefront of DevOps. And so it's like, all right, well, let's write to that concept, right? And extend into a new market or a new uh, audience that we may not have ever had before. And the, the success of that for us has been fantastic, as you can see by the user numbers I described earlier about Dev and Ops people actually. Uh, using our our solution quite a bit. Well, and you had someone that identified with the audience too, which is super important when you write something as well. I think a lot of us in security uh, have to research very carefully if we write for a different audience outside of security. You were fortunate to have a resource that that knew the audience. Well, uh, you know what? Yes, I would agree with you. Uh, The other way to do that is if you don't have that, if you don't have that lucky straw like I had, um, You'd be surprised how much you can write just as a just as an individual. Like I could have written a lot about DevOps and did write a lot about DevOps early on myself, even though I'm not a pro in that field. Mm. Um, because you don't have to write stuff that is like the most forward thinking, amazing research. People are always talking about wanting to write the best quality stuff. Put out good stuff that you're okay with, and it will resonate, right? So the, you don't necessarily have to have an expert on staff. The alternative to that, and something else that we did, was um, start like a week a week weekly webinar series or a monthly webinar series or, or something else around, uh, around the other space and bring in experts. So we run a monthly webinar series where uh, I think we've had out of like eight months that we've been running it, maybe two or three security people and the rest have all been DevOps people. Sorry, Michael, I cut you off like, like at least twice. No, that's all right. <laughs> you guys, you're, you're taking it the direction I wanted to go. All I wanted to, I wanted to get Tyler's opinion on it, but you guys kind of answered it. And it was, if you're not sure what to write about, just write about the conversations that you're having. Somebody asks you something and you're not sure how to answer it, go write that. At least that's kind of what I took from it. And I think based on everything that you guys said, uh, what, is that kind of an approach that you would take, Tyler? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's about uh, quantity of items. Again, a minimum bar of, of quality, of course. But it's about quantity of items when you're doing content and outbound-based marketing. All right. So we have a, we have a question on the, live, on the live video on Facebook. So how do you measure that content effectiveness? Huh, great question. And so it's funny, as a, as a marketer for the last year here at Signal Sciences, um, I spent the first three months just writing content and finding people inside my organization to write content. Simultaneously to writing content, I built out every measurement engine you could imagine. Uh, <laughs> everything fr- from uh, you know just looking at raw hits to looking at keyword improvements to looking at SEO to looking at uh, every single download on our website, every web page hit, and figuring out which uh, which content pieces were being hit the most. Doing all sorts of data analytics on that and trying to determine what is resonating with our audience. Um, and so the, the flip side of the content creation coin is you have to be able to measure those results. If you can't measure those results, you can't double down on success. Um, and so for us, we, we put out tons of content, both in like white papers and eBooks and, uh, uh, tons of blog posts. And I literally did spreadsheet after spreadsheet of analytics on all of this stuff to determine where I was getting the most return on my investment for our time. And eventually I actually transitioned all of that into return on investment for dollar spend. Um, mm-hmm. but you know what I've been creating now for the the last eight months within signal science is creating dashboards weekly and tweaking dashboards every single week to get more and more, uh, exact on, on, kind of the historical analytics and the future future direction analytics I want to take. So I think that's a great point. You have to make sure you can measure it or you won't be successful. So on that, since you've done so much, what surprised you? Looking back over it, because you've got a lot of experience here. So there must, you can kind of get a sense for some things. But now when you really start measuring it, biggest surprise looking back at the last eight months of, of really digging into it. Yeah, so there's probably a couple things. Um, one was the, the quality uh, surprise, right? Because if you look at my background, um, I was a, a researcher, uh, <laughs> academic style researcher for years, right? Where you only put out the top end 
quality, uh, you know, and you, you, you work for six months on a project to move the security bar six inches, and then you write a uh, report on it and go on the lecture circuit from there. And so you don't put out, you do not put out uh, okay quality work that you put out the top or, or any, or nothing at all. Right. And that's, that I'd say is the biggest learning that I've had is that, um, you don't have to put out rocket science material. Um, that's the biggest surprise I've had too. Is I, I did not expect that. Had you asked me that a year ago, I probably wouldn't have had that realization. Um, but the last year has been very enlightening on that. The other thing I think I've learned is, you know, it's uh, I went into this thing saying, let's do guerrilla marketing, guerrilla, guerrilla, guerrilla. Mm-hmm. What are the ways that I can, <clears throat> you know, I, I want to drive a taco truck right into the into the uh, uh, parking lot of that conference. And I almost did it actually for one early on conference, uh, and just give away free tacos for hours, right? And um, just whatever the the I didn't care what it was the weirdest ideas you could do, um, and it's funny I thought those were going to give me the stickiness and the cool thing is they gave me the brand they impacted my brand people remembered those activities um, but they didn't give me the leads and what gave me the leads and the opportunities to sell business were a lot of the traditional channels uh, events content. Um, so while I tried to reinvent the wheel early on, I think I was fortuitous in that it got my brand out there really well. Um, and then it allowed me to transition into kind of the traditional marketing models that really hit well. So that's definitely something that surprised me. I thought I could be kept in gorilla forever uh, and it didn't work that way. <clears throat> Tyler, what's one of the craziest things that's ever happened when you were at a startup? Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't have any HubSpot style stories if that's what you're asking. Thank God. Um, (laughs) we'll, we'll leave that for an exercise to the reader to go look up what I mean by that. But, um, uh, geez. Um, you know, I've, I've had plenty of, uh, technology security startups where we've taken companies offline and, and destroyed databases. And we had, uh, we had one engineer when I was working at, uh, at, at stake, uh, actually do a SQL injection attack on a um, insurance company's beneficiary beneficiary database uh, and accidentally overwrote all of the beneficiaries for every member of that database. So everybody <laughs> everybody at that insurance company, uh, if they died or had an insurance claim, would uh, go to Yo Mama. <laughs> that, that's a pretty crazy situation. I mean, we had plenty of those where we actually broke things and destroyed things. We actually took down a, uh, a web app once where uh, uh, it was a... Uh, uh, directory traversal bug where you tried to upload and then erase a file. And if you used, if you used dot, dot, slash a bunch of times, you ended up erasing files off the root directory. Well, we accidentally erased the WinNT directory uh, and, and killed the server, which is fine, except that we didn't know that's what happened. So when they switched over to their backup, the engineer that was doing it did it again um, and destroyed their backup server, and they didn't have any tape backups or, or digital backups. So we actually destroyed their entire app. So we've had plenty of stories like that. <sighs> Michael, more questions for Tyler as we uh, kind of round out the the segment. Well, yeah. So we do. We've been asking people some standard, and you've got a lot of experience. You're advising startups. Somebody listening to us right now, they're maybe thinking the side hustle, right? That's the new phrasing everybody loves. What would you advise them to do? They might maybe still for now have their day job. Is there a particular segment of the space that you think is ready for a security startup or maybe not yet ready so it's a good time for people to start laying the groundwork? Somebody listening right now going, all right, we're coming up on the holidays. I'm going to have some time. I'm ready. What would you tell them to do? Wow. I mean, I could I could dump my entire backlog of ideas and failed startups <laughs> and say, take any of these. <laughs> um, that would probably be one way to answer the question. I mean, I did one in uh, 2012. I did one where I wanted to do a, uh, a little box that you could plug into your wall in your home and have it um, scan, scan all of your IoT devices in your home automatically secure and change those default passwords, right? Might have helped with Mirai, but I was too, too early, a uh, few years too early, couldn't get funding for it. So I mean, there's, there's millions of ideas, and I think the key thing here, guys, is you don't necessarily have to think of uh, starting a startup as that pivotal moment in time. Starting a startup really is coming up with the idea and, and iterating it yourself, right? Um, and so that could be as simple as iterating uh, with potential customers and saying, here's, here's what I'm thinking of doing. Help me get to a better vision. Uh, if you're not the tech guy, if you're the tech guy, it might be sitting down and actually coding revisions of an MVP, right? A minimum viable product. But the key to success at any startup early on is literally only traction. Do whatever it can, whatever you can to create 
traction. And traction comes in two forms. Traction comes in the form of uh, customer traction, meaning you have customers who are interested in what you're doing and are tracking you and are maybe signing letters of intent or even giving you money. And then the other side of that is traction on technology. Okay, so actually creating technology that is moving closer to the product market fit. And those should be for, for literally from day one of your of the idea uh, until until end of the company, those are the focuses for what you're going to be doing. So don't sit there and say, you know what, I work full time. I'm not going to have any time to do this. Had I uh, continued to work on that 2012 startup of that little box inside the house and actually kept traction on that from an engineering standpoint for the four years since I came up with the idea, I would have been in the sweet spot to capitalize on the Mirai botnet that DDoS the the, web, the DNS servers recently, right? Um, but I didn't. I didn't keep traction on that. So it ended up becoming a, a yet another story of a failed startup. So um, I think it comes down to just little steps every single day. You're running a marathon, a lifetime marathon. All right. So let me flip that around then. And you led into the other question I wanted to ask. Because we, what we try to do on the show a lot of times, and, and this is not so much for you, but it's for everybody listening, we like to look at it from what's it, what's it like to be an investor, what's it like to be on the startup side, but then we also look at what's it like on the enterprise side, where you want to get some of these startups in, but sometimes you look at it internally and say, well, am I going to take on risk? Is somebody going to be upset that I did this? They're kind of new. So somebody listening in the enterprise who says, wait, I, how do I, A, learn about some of these new startups, other than, of course, watching our program, but then... <laughs> What advice would you give them to support that startup trying to get to that fit, trying to get that traction? Have you gained any insights that would help somebody in an enterprise who says, hey, I want to support startups. Uh, I think that's how we're going to advance our industry. What do they need to think about to make that work for them? Yeah, it's about de-risking the problem for them. Um, you know, you, you're not going to see a, a major Fortune 20 go and say, you know what, here's a million dollars. Uh, you're not going to see this very often, I should say. Uh, here's a million dollars for your product. We're going to go ahead and buy your product for the next three years uh, when you're a 10-person startup. That's very, very rare. But what you will see is, you know, a 50K deal, a 100K deal, a 20K deal that kind of keeps keeps things going, keeps the revenue stream afloat and helps you iterate with that customer, right? Um, so this one young startup uh, where right here in Raleigh where I live, I've been working with them now for six months. And I keep telling them, uh, at this point, I don't even care if you make a dime. Just go to that big, you know, that big customer that you were talking about. If it happens to be a Fortune 50 customer, give your technology to them for free today. Just get in that door, build that relationship, give it to them for free, iterate till you've got a great market fit, and then go sell it to somebody else. Because all that matters right now is getting to MVP. And so... Um, yep. You know, as far as what I would tell the big companies uh, on how to interact with with uh, young startup vendors, it largely depends on how risky they are. The more risky they are, the less you want to invest with them. But build the relationship and work together. Look at what's going to make that five person startup in a garage a hundred thousand dollars could could be gold to them. So give them that hundred thousand dollars and iterate closer to what you need as a technology. Yeah, it iterates what what other people on the show have said uh, recently. Tyler is that your early customers are in an, in essence early investors as well. Absolutely, absolutely. At the end of the day, they're investing their mo mo not even their money, their resources, their time and resources yeah, exactly. to help you to help you get your company better. Yeah. So I just editorialize, and what I love about that is it means that if you're listening to us now and you want to figure out how to do your side hustle, you want to embed this startup mindset into your own culture. Go find some startups that you like. Figure out how to work with them. You're going to give them a lifeline or a real benefit, and you're going to get one too if you embrace it the right way. I think that's the best editorial I've ever heard of, the, of that vision. That's absolutely right. Give them a lifeline, and you'll get better return. You'll get innovation from them, which is exactly what you want. I like it. Outstanding. Tyler, thank you very much for appearing on Startup Security Weekly. And you've been looking forward for the, to this for a long time. I hope we met your expectations. Uh, I'm sure our listeners and viewers are going to love it. So thank you very much, Tyler. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> We're taking a short break. Come right back. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 